you can't just say you're pregnant and that's a woman's problem, that's a woman's issue. There's another person in the relationship and we need to include men in that. I was working in the fertility clinic. The types of questions that I was being asked was actually quite shocking, but I was surprised that the baseline knowledge of people in society is actually quite low because we aren't taught about this at school. What kind of questions were you being asked? The fundamental thing with fertility is time. It's time and no one realises that your age is so important. We shouldn't feel pressured to have children quickly. We should be able to pursue our life ambition and not feel pressured by the family members or friends who are also having children. Why don't we change the conversation? Instead of being so reactive, let's be preventative and let's give people knowledge. If we can identify our egg count early and know if there's a problem, then that can help women and men to plan their future. Ravina, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Oh, big welcome. You work as a doctor in the NHS, mm -hmm. but to stop there is only literally half the story because you do a lot of work when it comes to raising awareness around particular health issues, being on the advisory board of companies, and also you do a lot in femtech and social media. But I think for those people who haven't come across you before, can you give us a little bit of a background to your story. Yes, of course. So I'm Ravina, Ravina Bannock. I am an NHS uh, medical doctor and I've specialised in women's health. Um, I do a lot of things outside of that. So my particular interest is educating um, on women's health on social media platforms. Yeah. And um, in terms of my background, I've also dabbled in some femtech. So I've been on medical advisory boards for um, femtech startups like Yopi um, and some other ones called Right Angled as well. Since then, I've also started my own company called Sonas Fertility, which is a home hormone test to help women identify more about their eggs. Um, and I can tell you a little bit more about that as well. Brilliant, brilliant. So why medicine? What got you involved in this area to begin with? Yeah, I think it's such a good question. So many people ask me, and you know what, when you go for your medical school interview, they ask you, why medicine? <laughs> but I won't give you that answer. I'll give you, I'll give you another answer. And um, I think growing up, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. And I think you only really know when you experience something yourself. Yeah. So, um, I didn't have any medics in my family. I didn't really have any exposure to medicine. But you are meant to do some work experience before you apply to medicine. And so I I did lots of work experience. I did some in a bank. I did some in finance. And then I, I thought, oh, maybe let's try medicine. Let's let's work in a hospital. And one of my best friends, um, who's still my best friend now, her mum works in obstetrics and gynecology. And she was the only, she was actually the only doctor I knew. And I said, oh, is it okay if I just spend, you know, a week with you? And I didn't know what she would say, but she said, yes, of course you can. Of course you can come. And, you know, I felt like I was a little, little meek girl. I didn't know where I was. I'd never even stepped foot into a hospital before. And now I'm here in the labor ward yeah. with women screaming from every room. Yeah. And I'm following the consultant and not really sure what to expect, but probably just chucked straight into the deep end seeing blood, amniotic fluid, running into theatre, buzzers going off. And it was just such an extraordinary experience. And it was just, I think it was a turning point that this is amazing. I haven't felt so excited to be in an environment. I didn't feel that in any other environment that I'd been in. So I think that was when sort of the seed was planted. After that, I knew that being with women, being in women's health was something that I had had an interest in. So that progressed when I was at medical school. And then when I did become a doctor, I was working in the labour ward, but not shadowing, but actually working, helping with C-sections, helping with deliveries. And is this the part in medicine where you go around after every what, six months or so to different fields to see what you like to specialise in? Exactly, exactly. So during medical school, you do a few rotations, but of course you're shadowing, you're learning, you're there to sort of develop your medical knowledge. Only after that's when you're you're there, you're in the job, you're a professional and you're expected to do do the job. So it was when I had my six month block in obstetrics and gynecology where I then recollected how I was as a 18 year old. And then I came back, you know, 10 years later and I was like, 
wow, you know what? That feeling that I got when I first stepped into a hospital, I'm still getting it. I'm still getting that feeling of wanting to be involved in women's care, wanting to help them in that fundamental moment which actually defines many women you know having a baby is a huge moment in women and men's lives yeah and you get to be a part of that and I thought wow how amazing and and the the gratefulness they have to doctors in that moment in their lives is is um is something that you really cherish you think wow I actually helped them in this moment to deliver that baby and to you know get through this really challenging part of labor yeah yeah and There was a really clear point, though, in your career when you went from obviously being really interested in women's health and being quite passionate about it to wanting to turn towards the education side of things. I think that's seen quite heavily in the work that you do on social media, but also we're going to talk about this, the work that you do in Femtech as well. So when did that point happen when you thought, okay, instead of being reactionary to symptoms, I'm going to start educating people? Yeah, that's a really good question. So as a a medic, you are taught the information and you're taught how to treat it. And in this day and age, I think that's great, but we have so many platforms of information where people and patients are getting the information from. Yeah. And not all of that's correct. And I realised this when I was, I was on that placement. So I'd finished medical school, I'd now been a doctor for two years. And I was working in clinics, I was working in the fertility clinic. I was working in um, I was working in a GP surgery at the time where women were coming and men actually were coming with fertility issues, and the types of questions that I was being asked was actually quite shocking for me. For, for me, and and I do appreciate that I've had an education in this in this area, but I was surprised that the baseline knowledge of of people in in society is actually quite low because we aren't taught about this at school. What kind of questions were you being asked? So people asking me things like, especially to do with, with sex, actually, and, and they were quite embarrassed to ask questions about sex. They said, is it possible for me to get pregnant from sitting on a toilet seat? Is it possible for me to uh, get chlamydia from sitting on a toilet seat? And and I'm thinking, actually, it's a really valid question. And and of course, why why would people ever get taught that at school? It's not something that... We're told about in biology or, you know, sexual education, if if your school had that. And so there's grown men and women who are who are really concerned about being pregnant and um, having a sexually transmitted infection. Women are worried that they perhaps are having a miscarriage. They don't know the symptoms of a miscarriage. They're saying, oh, I'm having loads of bleeding. Does that mean I'm having a miscarriage? Of course, that's definitely something you don't learn about at school. And that's, of course, it's nothing nothing you learn about. Why would you? And so I realise there's this huge gap and disparity between medical professionals and the general public. And the only way to sort of bridge that gap is if, at current state, is if patients come and see a doctor, if they make that trip to the GP, if they make that trip to hospital. But there's nothing in between. And you can't, of course, trust everything you read on Dr. Google, which every patient does. And of course, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you? Um, so I think to provide good quality evidence-based information to people is is a really easy thing that I can do. It helps alleviate a lot of anxiety. And if I can make a difference to one person and answer one person's question, I'm happy. But I, from experience, I note that actually many women and men have the same questions that they want answering. Interesting. So I think it's actually a really simple thing just to produce a quick YouTube video, five minutes, this is what PCOS is. And this is what you can do to try and reduce your symptoms. I think that's a really easy way to not only educate people, but also reduce the burden on the NHS. If people are are a bit more well-informed and a bit more educated, then they might think, actually, perhaps I don't have PCOS because I don't seem to have those symptoms. And perhaps, you know, I should look at something else. I think the turning point for me was when I was working in the GP practice. As a GP, you're the first you're the first point point of call. You get everyone in society, everyone in your local population that are calling you up. And I was just getting loads of questions and I said, It's really easy to answer these questions, but I feel I feel almost it's a disadvantage to so many people that they don't have this knowledge. Yeah. So that was when I thought, I can do something about this. Let me just do something quite fun. Um, started on sort of Instagram, uh, then moved on to TikTok and, and people were asking me questions. And, and I found it was quite easy to answer those generically. I'm mean, interested to know, with all the questions that you were getting when you were in that GP practice, what were some of the questions that you were getting from men? I think women's health 
is a, a big taboo topic, but so is men's health and so is fertility and so is miscarriage. It's all part and parcel. You can't just say you're pregnant and that's a woman's problem. That's a woman's issue. There's another person in the relationship and we need to include men in that. Some things that I heard from men were common issues like erectile dysfunction. And erectile dysfunction can come for many different reasons. Conditions like diabetes can cause it, but also psychological issues. So if people have had a, a difficult past or if they're anxious or they're stressed, that can cause erectile dysfunction. Alongside that, infertility. So men who are trying to get pregnant with their partners, mm-hmm. Usually it's, it's the women that are bringing the men in and they come as a couple and we do like to to treat men and women together, especially for, for fertility issues. Analyzing their sperm, that's what's something we can do in the GP surgery. If it's abnormal, we do repeat and then refer them on to fertility services. So generally things to do with sexual dysfunction and getting pregnant. I'm really interested to delve into women's health issues and we touched on earlier about some of the taboos that surround that. What are the top women's health issues for people who want to know? It depends on where we're looking. So in the UK, our issues are going to differ very significantly to those in Africa, India, the East, the West. For this, I'll just focus on the UK because that's my experience. Women's health is a huge topic. It's huge, ranging from things like irregular periods, PCOS, fibroids, endometriosis, which are benign gynae conditions. By that, I mean not cancerous. These aren't cancerous conditions. And then you have your women's health cancers. So ovarian cancer, endometrial cancer. And then you also have pregnancy, which is a different stage. Sort of if you move down a woman's timeline, which is how I like to sort of categorize them, You have women right at the beginning of their reproductive age, 13, starting their periods. And then women are fertile. So then you get through to uh, the pregnancy and then sort of fertility fits in with that pregnancy. So there are issues that women face in every single stage of that of that journey. Yeah. And there's just so many to go into. Um, I think two that I would would specify and, and, and pull out of that is one PCOS Um, which is something that affects women earlier on, but many women actually don't find out about until they're trying to conceive. Ah, okay. They try for many years and then only then they get a scan and there's lots of cysts on the ovaries and they have all the symptoms that go with it. So that can sometimes be a delayed diagnosis. And the second is menopause. Menopause is a huge issue and there's just not enough information about around menopause. Yeah. And now in sort of in the recent two months, there's been changes in Um, corporates so they're giving more allowances to women to have days off if they're experiencing menopausal symptoms and I think that's an amazing thing people are actually recognizing this is a huge thing affecting women I would also touch on fertility I think it's such a huge taboo that everyone is so worried to talk about and there's a stigma isn't there on women and men who can't conceive firsthand I know that many women come to me and say look I can't talk to anyone I need to take days off from work for my IVF or to get some blood tests done or to get a scan done. But they can't tell, they they feel they can't tell their employer. Why do you think that is? Why do you think there is such a taboo around issues surrounding fertility? I think it's an evolutionary issue. I think as humans, we are expected to reproduce. That is evolutionary. That is our purpose. And I don't believe that people should have this view. But people think if they can't reproduce then they don't have a purpose. They don't They don't have that human instinct that we're made to have. But of course, there's so many confounding factors that affect fertility. Our diet, our environment, the pollution, global warming, all these external factors have an impact on our bodies, which then have an impact on our sperm and our egg count. And that then obviously determines fertility. From your experiences, is there anything sort of personal that has led to you wanting to be more involved in this particular area of women's health? I think if we go back, if I go back to my childhood, so maybe about 15 years ago when I was growing up, I was living in quite a Caucasian area and I noticed that I was perhaps a bit more hairy than other girls and I think a lot of a lot of young girls think this. They say, oh, but why am I, why do I have bushy eyebrows? Why do I have hair on my face? Yeah, yeah. Um, is that normal? And we try and normalise things. We're like, oh, but, you know, 
we're we're brown, so perhaps the hair looks darker on our skin. Or, you know, my mum was hairy, so that's why I'm hairy. And I remember thinking this. I thought, oh, but I've got quite quite a lot of hair on my body. Is that normal? And as as a young child, I thought, yeah, that's fine. My friend, some of my my other Asian friends, they had hairy skin. They had um, hair on their skin as well. And I found that actually, only going through medical school and you learn more information. I was thinking, why didn't I question that at the time? Why didn't I see my doctor? But why at the time I thought this is not a medical issue. Having hair on your body isn't a medical issue. We all have hair. But why didn't we question it? Why don't why don't you question that you've got a monobrow and a moustache at age 15 and no one else does? I realised that we should be questioning things because that's a sign of PCOS. And having um, weight that you can't shift is a sign of PCOS. Or having um, irregular periods. So many people normalise that. Oh, I've just got irregular periods. Oh, they'll normalise at some point. But it's been six years and they haven't normalized (laughs) you know why are we not questioning these things earlier Mm -hmm. so I think from my own experience of not questioning things and then seeing young girls come to me saying oh I've just got a few spots on my face and you know I'm using all you know I've bought lots of beauty products and lots of new skincare and so I think it'll get better but actually I can I notice on your face you've got quite a quite a lot of cysts and pustules should we try something for that should we do some blood tests and see what's going on here? Only from my own experience of, of having a lot of hair and having spots, I've realised that we should be questioning this early. So I'd say, I'd say, yeah, I think that was my own experience of realising it's not something to be ignored, which perhaps it was 10 years ago, but, but more people are coming forward now. It's a bit more spoken about now. I think that's such an interesting point you made because you're right, because a lot of these female-related health issues, let's say PCOS, it's... This early, early symptoms can just be almost shrugged off as being like, oh, those are normal, like you're getting more acne, you're getting a bit of hair on your face, you know, there's some weight gain. And if you don't have the awareness of what PCOS is, it's very easy just to glide past it and to just think, oh, this is just a normal part of life or being a teenager or being a young young adult. If we go back to talking about fertility, I know this is a really passionate area for you because you decided to get involved in this on a femtech level as well. So can you tell us a little bit about the work you've been doing outside of social media, outside of being a doctor in the NHS? Talk to me about your company. Yeah, okay. So I started a company called Sonas Fertility. Zonas is a home hormone test that helps women to identify if they have a good ovarian reserve, so a good number of eggs. Um, So it's something that you order, it comes to your home, it's a fingerprint test and you send it to our lab and then we analyse the results and tell you a little bit about your pregnancy implications, uh, implications for your menopause and your fertility and chances of IVF. Um, And it's something that you can get at the fertility clinic when you get there. Uh, but of course, we know the wait's about two to three years at the moment. Oh, wow. To get to, get to that point. And the fundamental thing with fertility is time. It's time. And no one realises that your age is so important. So if we can identify our egg count early and know if there's a problem, then that can help women and men and couples who want to have children to plan their future why don't we change the conversation instead of being so reactive let's be preventative and let's give people knowledge and everyone everyone likes knowledge you know women are tracking their periods on apps people are tracking their calories and their step count on their on their watches it's just the change in in thinking for our generation everyone is becoming a little a little bit more tech savvy they want to know about their statistics and how many hours they're sleeping and what their egg count's doing and what, you know, how their periods are being affected month on month. So I think it's going in, in trend with what people want. So it's, it's, it's just tying up with the generation we're in and seeing the problems firsthand and linking those two things together. So you notice this gap in the market and then you've now got this whole task of setting up a business whilst also managing your day job and, and your social media work. So how did Ravina, the business woman, come about? <laughs> oh, it's funny. I always put, I would never call myself a business woman because I fundamentally am always, I'm always a doctor. It's what I, it's what I've trained for 10 years to do. It's what 
I do on an everyday basis. And I never really look at it like it's, you know, it's a business. It's something that I feel passionate about. And I always saw it as a passion project. And I found it really exciting. You know, it's, um, I found it really exciting to find a solution. And then people would say, oh, can I get the test? Or what can I learn from the test? And, and then getting really good feedback from women. What you sometimes find is, you have lots of tech savvy people and I'm, I'm not one of those people. I'm not building apps and everything, but you have really tech savvy people and they're trying to find solutions for problems. And I can see the problems. Yeah. But I think, you know, as I grow, I'll need more people in my team to help me with all the tech side of things. Yeah. Because honestly, as, as, you, as you know, if you're running a company, it's, you can't do everything yourself. You need, you need help with that. When it comes to having healthy conversations with people who are experiencing fertility issues, what are some of the things that we can be conscious about when speaking to our friends and family members? I think it's a really good question. Every person will have a different journey and every person will react to that differently. I think it's always best for the couple to open up about it when they feel ready. Yeah. And I think especially in in some cultures, it's deemed to be normal to ask people, when are you going to have a baby? You know, do you want to have kids? You know, time's ticking. Yeah. And they, they're sometimes just said in jest. They're not, there's no bad intention behind it. But just those comments can be so detrimental to the mental health of that couple who are trying to conceive. Yeah. And no one knows that they may have just had a miscarriage. No one knows that they may be going through IVF. So I think we do need to be careful with that kind of language. Only speaking from my experience, I would never mention it unless someone wanted to talk to me about it. Yeah. But some people may actually want someone else to start the conversation. And that might be their opportunity to say, actually, yeah, we are having problems. I just didn't know how to tell anyone. Mm -hmm. I think from families that I've spoken to, I've actually treated a, a whole family, so the brothers and the sisters, and I dealt with one one patient, and she was going for IVF, and she said, please don't tell the rest of my family, I know you're treating them. Um, so then the brother came in the week after, and of course, because of patient confidenti- confidentiality, would never mention it, but it just shows even within own family units, you don't always discuss it. I, I would say it has to be up to the man and woman, and when they feel ready to talk to someone about it, to then open up the conversation. Um, but I think as a as society in general, we should talk about it. We should talk about how we shouldn't feel pressured to have children quickly. We should be able to pursue our life ambition and not feel pressured by the family members or friends who are also having children. Because of course, you know, we're always influenced by the people around us. And sometimes you see your best friend and, you know, they're pregnant and you're like, oh, if they're getting pregnant, maybe we should be doing it. And it's just so natural. We want to be like our peers. It has to be a generic conversation and it shouldn't be targeted at anybody. You can't ask someone, when are you going to have children? No. I think it's time. You know, it's just those sort of comments don't help anyone. I agree. And I think you're right, looking at it from a societal perspective, if you tackle it from that angle, then it means that eventually the conversations become easier at a more intimate level. And like now, I, I do think that there is that balance between some people would never ask the question. Some people still do. Maybe 10 years ago, a lot more people would ask the question about whether you're going to have a baby soon or, you know, why haven't you had a baby yet? So maybe in 10 years time, things are going to gradually change. You put out loads of content on TikTok and Instagram and YouTube oh, across a whole range of women's health issues. What have been the response from people? I've done a few Instagram lives with women that have done have gone through IVF. Um, and they've been really open to share their story of, of what it was like to go through failed attempts and then the process of actually going through IVF. And I don't know if many people know, but IVF is a process. So you first have to inject yourself with um, a medication that helps to stimulate your ovaries to produce lots of eggs. And then you have to remove those eggs and then you fertilize them and then you get it reinserted. And in that process, some women might choose to freeze their eggs. It's a really long process. And after that, Instagram live it was about 20 minutes really short just a, a quick Q&A and my messages were just flooded with so many women that said thank you for actually telling us because I didn't know that was what IVF was I didn't know I had to inject myself every day to get to stimulate my ovaries I thought it was just a quick procedure I fell asleep and then you know wake up and I've got 
a fertilized um a fertilized egg in me and i had messages saying you know i had a similar experience or i i had something that was quite different to this but i'm really glad you told me that you know someone else's journey was simpler i'm thinking about ivf what's your opinion and of course i can't give a medical opinion on it but i could give them a- enough knowledge for them to feel educated on the topic so it was overwhelmingly positive and it was something that was so small. It was, I, I could have, you know, I, I always feel that I can do more. And I think most of us feel, you know, I wish I could do more. Yeah, yeah. But I, you know, it was just a short conversation actually opened so many doors for women and they felt more knowledgeable after it. Okay. I'm sure you get a lot of questions on you, especially on your Instagram. What are some of the popular questions that women have asked you? That's actually a really good question. You know what? We actually spoke about this earlier, but... I would say loads of people get worried about discharge. Okay. So vaginal discharge is what everyone loves to talk about. They say, oh, mine's sticky, mine's green, mine's yellow, mine has a bit of blood in it. What does it mean? And so I did um, I did a reel on it quite a long time ago. It was just really popular. Everyone wanted to know what it, what it meant. And it's something that women are really interested in. So vaginal discharge is one that's really popular. And another one that I actually put, put up a video yesterday and just overnight it blew up and it was something so simple. The common signs and symptoms you should be aware of for gynecological cancers. Oh, interesting. And it's something that not everyone knows about. And I found that giving people the key red flags for cancers, key red flags for PCOS, key red flags for fibroids, um, and and talking about vaginal discharge have been really popular. <laughs> so if you want to know about vaginal discharge, check out the Instagram. Something that we do like to talk about on this podcast is essentially about being quite open about the things that we don't necessarily know about, which is very much the topic of what we've been speaking about when it comes to women's health. So if we look more into your career and your journey, what is something that has helped you in your career that you know now that you really didn't know at the beginning? And you can pick when in your career that was, whether it's medicine, when you started doing social media, you can decide on that. So something I wish I knew and started implementing earlier on in my career was talking to people and networking. So you can have, you can be the cleverest person in the room, but it's actually your colleagues, it's your friends, it's people you meet that teach you a lot, that introduce you to opportunities, um, open your eyes up to things that you perhaps hadn't. And it's something I noticed and started doing towards the end of medical school was going to medical conferences. Um, I went to um, Giant. It's one of the biggest health tech conferences. And that's when I started getting into health tech. Yeah. But I didn't know that this whole world of health tech even existed because my head was always in the books. I was was studying medicine. We were revising for exams. We were um, seeing patients. We were on the ward in hospital. But then I thought, actually, you can use technology to help with medicine and this is what all these people are doing. There's all these clever uh, people making apps and linking up with scientists and, and bringing the two together. And I found actually going to that conference, then me and my friends, um, we were really inspired after that. And we, we just dabbled in a bit of tech at the time. We were just students. We didn't know how to code or anything. Um, and we, st- we started a very, very um, a pilot of, a, of, of an app. And it was basically a, a talk to your doctor app yeah um via via just your telephone and it was really exciting we're like oh wow we're doing something that's med tech you know it's a cool phrase we didn't know what it was at the time but we're like let's you know let's go talk to people that have done this and after that I then that opened another opportunity because I then worked at a med tech company during one of my summers and I worked in um, a company called right angled and they did remote testing and then that opened another door to Yopi, which is a it's another femtech company and they give um they do sort of organic tampons and i was helping them with some of their education and i just found that one thing le- leads to another and all you need to do is just talk to people and you know just say hi hi what are you up to because everyone has their own story everyone's got their own background and passion and 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 bringing all of that together really helps you to identify you know what I really enjoyed this conversation how about we exchange numbers and how about we meet up or connect and and I think that's something I wish I did sooner because you're surrounded by amazing doctors you're surrounded by amazing people around you 
So using your network to your advantage can really help you to develop yourself as a person and make an impact on your on your local network. As you progress with your career and get more and more heavily involved with Femtech, how are you going to be balancing everything? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. At the moment, I feel like I'm just juggling. I'm spinning plates, doing different things and having different roles. I think it will definitely be a balance. The way that I am is that I love doing different things. I get bored if I'm doing the same thing every day. So I love doing my NHS work, even if that does mean the night shifts and weekend shifts, which it is at the moment. It's fun. It's exciting. And you get to deal with the patients. You know, you're the first person talking to them and and you can identify the problems that they're dealing with. So I love my NHS work. I love doing social media in my spare time and my days off. And and Femtech is something I like doing as another passion project, which is also my weekends and days off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think it will just be a balancing act. It will be a matter of doing a few days on each and I can target my education and help towards different populations uh, whilst doing that. My local population when I'm doing my practice in an NHS setting and um, are perhaps a bit wider on social media and then Femtech, you know, that's also a, a wider audience. So I feel that I can sort of tackle different populations on different levels. For those people who want to find you on social media and learn more about your work and more about Zonas as well, where can they find you? Yeah, so you can find me on uh, Instagram. You can find me on TikTok and YouTube at Dr. Ravina. Um, on Instagram, it's Ravina. And on YouTube, I do lots of short videos on any condition that you want. I'm happy for any direct messages as well if you want me to cover any specific topics. And I also have a podcast called Fertility and Femtech, which is also um, available anywhere you listen to a podcast. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for being on the podcast. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's been great.